All right, good evening and welcome to Border City Data. Thanks everybody for coming out tonight. My name is Doug Sartori. I'm the principal consultant at Parallel 42 Systems. We do a lot of work with uh, data and data manipulation and my personal area of focus is Microsoft SQL Server. Tonight, I'm gonna talk to you about SQL Command which is a tool that I use quite a bit in my work wrangling data, and it solves a lot of problems for me. Um, the work that I do involves moving data from disparate line of business systems into a single database or file, or populating several tables with similar data sets, and SQL Command really excels at those tasks. So uh, let's dig in. Um, firstly, I want to uh, give you some information about the utility itself um, and also a note on pronunciation. I'm going to call it SQL command because SQLCMD is just a little bit too cumbersome for this talk. I'm not sure exactly what Microsoft's preferred pronunciation is, but we're going to call it SQL command. Um, this tool has been around for a while, and it's most often used for scripting queries. You'll see people use SQL command um, quite a bit uh, to, to run ad hoc queries as part of a batch process, um, and I think it's generally thought of as a systems administration tool. Um, but I think that SQL command has um, a lot more utility and can be a, a really valuable tool for um, database administrators and data engineers who want to um, maximize the efficiency of their code. Um, one of the things that you see a lot um, in applications where it is necessary to um, make arbitrary accessing of data from multiple sources you'll see dynamic SQL used a lot. Um, and for those who aren't familiar with it, dynamic SQL um, in the uh, Microsoft universe is generally talking about constructing a string, uh, a character string of SQL commands, queries and so forth, and then executing that um, from, from uh, within a query. It's a technique that's very widely used. I've used it myself. There are a couple of reasons why um, we want to avoid using dynamic SQL if possible. Uh, first and foremost, I think there are some security risks that we need to be concerned with. Anytime that we are um, accepting user input and then constructing uh, a query out of that user input as well as some of our own strings, we run the risk of SQL injection attacks happening um, and that's not good. Beyond that, um, it's very difficult to debug um, uh, dynamic SQL. Uh, it's, it's something that I've worked with a lot and it has some, some real cons and, and a big part of the, the reason that I wanted to find a tool that I could use as an alternative um, to dynamic SQL is, is those, those challenges. And um, it's really actually quite hard to reason about a bit of dynamic SQL because um, it's generally, um, well, it's composed with uh, Transact SQL um, string manipulation tools, which are um, pretty limited. And it's very hard to read that code and it's pretty hard to reason about. So for those reasons, um, anything that allows us to avoid dynamic SQL or dynamic SQL is, um, is a good thing. And SQL command kind of fills that niche. It also allows us to reuse code more easily. Um, in a data warehouse application that I worked on over the past couple of years, we had a, a situation where each individual data engineer needed their own development environment. Um, and we wanted to write code that we could test uh, in our test environment, that developers could test in their own environment, um, as well as be able to actually validate that code through testing and then then move it into production without any changes. That's tough to do if you're writing um, SQL code that is static. Uh, it means that you have to either make some compromises in the way that you set up your data environment, or you have to go in and hand manipulate your code in order to promote it to production. So um, it's, it's a lot easier to reuse code and you can reduce the weight of code in your solution by using a tool like SQL command. Um, 
it, it, uh, it allows you to um, take similar queries and, and rather than have to repeat similar queries over and over and over again in a file, you can have um, something more compact. You can have one instance of that query that you're plugging different values into as needed. Um, and that really, really helps. Um, the, the, one of the, the challenges, I think, in working in um, Transact SQL uh, is that the, the tooling is not fantastic from a developer point of view. If you're a person who straddles data engineering and software development, you'll probably know what I mean. The tooling that we have um, as SQL developers doesn't tend to promote um, some of the things that we've come to expect as software developers generally. So anything that we can use that is going to allow us to reuse code, to um, reduce the amount of boilerplate or redundant code that we're writing is going to provide a benefit. And SQL Command really helps us do that. Um, and uh, another place where I've found this to be very valuable is in uh, making debugging easier. There is uh, an application, um, a, a data, data engineering application that I wrote for a financial institution that, that weighed in around 10,000 lines of SQL code. Um, and you can imagine uh, if you've written any SQL code at all, you can imagine how challenging that might be uh, to debug and to manage. Um, again, the, the interactive debugging tools that um, you can use, at least within SQL Server Management Studio, are pretty limited. And one of the things that, that SQL Command allows us to do is take an extremely large query like that and chunk it out into components that make sense together, um, and then use those components in a master script. And, and when, when you do that, it means that those component scripts can then be um, can then be tested in isolation. They can be tested in isolation from all the rest of the code, which means that you don't have to worry about side effects when you're testing that code. And it also means that it's a lot easier to isolate um, and find problems in a specific area. That is something that has saved me many hours of um, of debugging time. And uh, and anyone who's who's watching who has done any amount of debugging at all knows what a frustrating and painstaking experience debugging can be. So anything that reduces the amount of time we have to spend doing it is a good thing. OK, um, but nothing comes without some negatives. And there are pros and cons to SQL command, just like any other tool that you might use in your day to day work. Um, it is a command line utility. So um, although we can uh, use SQL command from inside uh, SQL Server Management Studio, it is primarily a command line utility. It's not a graphical tool. Uh, and that means that you have to have some facility with the command line and you have to be comfortable working with the command line in, in order to get the most out of it. So that is something that um, you should be aware of when you're, when you're considering the use of this tool. It's not integrated with um, SQL Server Agent. It's not integrated with any of the infrastructure in Microsoft SQL Server for um, running jobs or for, um, for organizing your, your code. Your, your SQL command scripts will not live inside your data environment. So it does mean that you have to, um, you have to manage some some code in the file system rather than on the database server as your um, your functions and your stored procedures and views will all live on the database server. So that is something that adds a little bit of burden, um, particularly if you're in an environment where as a data engineer, you have limited access um, to the to the operating system of the servers that you're working with. That can definitely be a downside. Um, it's something that I've encountered in some client environments where uh, we are highly compartmentalized and access to systems is spread across multiple departments. It does mean that sometimes uh, you have to get cooperation from uh, other parts of the organization in order to fully implement a SQL command solution. So that's something to keep in mind. None of these to me are deal breakers, but they are things to consider um, when you're deciding what tooling you're going to use. Uh, and it can be trickier to debug those individual script components. Yes, this is both a pro and a con of SQL command. When we get into the demo, 
you'll see, uh, I think, some of the reasons why it's both a pro and a con. Um, you essentially are going to have to build a harness um, for testing and debugging your individual script components. Um, that's something that it's just a little bit of overhead that you have to, um, you have to consider and take into account when you're building your solution. Uh, again, I don't think any of these are deal breakers, but they are things to consider when you're making a decision about what tool you're going to use. So um, from the command line, we can use SQL command. And the, I've just given you on this slide a few of the highlights of, um, of the uh, possible arguments. When you run SQL command from the command line, there are some things that you must do. You must specify the instance of SQL Server that you want to connect to. Um, you optionally should specify the authentication method. SQL command assumes Windows integrated authentication, meaning that the user account, the Windows Active Directory user account that you are using um, to access the command line and log into your computer is what SQL command will assume is the, um, is the in identity that you should be using to connect to the server. So if that's not true, then you'll have to use some other arguments to, um, to specify exactly which, um, which security identity is needed and what is the method of authentication. For example, a SQL Server login with a password authentication would be one common method of accessing the database. Uh, you have to specify the database that you want to use in the um, SQL command session. And then there are, uh, so the next two bullet points here are two different ways that you can um, execute code with SQL command. Um, using the queue argument allows you to um, enter any query on the command line uh, as part of your uh, SQL command command string and the um, the tool will execute that SQL for you and return the results right in the command line um, environment. Or you can provide an input file, which is the, um, the SQL code that will be executed. Um, generally speaking, um, and you'll see how uh, in, in the, in the um, SQL environment, how we can execute code from within our scripts. Generally, when I build a solution like this, I want to minimize the footprint of stuff that we have to do on the command line. Uh, so I'll, I'll um, execute one master script uh, in a batch script or um, in a PowerShell script. And that master script will then um, execute all of the other SQL command files that, that we're working with. Um, I mentioned the uh, SQL login before, and if you want to see the full list of possible command line arguments, you can use the classic question mark um, um, argument and, and get some information. Just quickly going to just check on the chat here. Um, okay, just a, I see that, it, that Chris has a, um, just a cleanup question about the YouTube channel that this will be posted on. I will share that with you um, a little later, or perhaps um, Lauren, who is my friend and associate, will put that into the chat. Um, so now I want to get into the meat of what SQL command, um, what we are going to use, the tooling that we're going to use. The, the main and primary tool, um, kind of the reason that you pay the price of admission to use SQL command is variable substitution. Uh, you can see the syntax there and a quick example um, underneath it. Essentially, we use colon. Um, in SQL command, colon indicates in any SQL script that what follows is a SQL command keyword. The, um, the keyword in this case is set var. And um, it has two arguments, the first argument being the name of the variable, and the second argument in quotation marks being the value um, that we want to set for that variable. Once we've got that, um, once we've got that variable set, we can then um, drop that variable anywhere we want inside our code. SQL command is a preprocessor. All of the SQL command stuff 
gets done before SQL executes your script. And I'm going to put an asterisk on that because there is a scenario where you can um, you can play a few tricks uh, in order to um, in order to make SQL command variables happen dynamically as a result of the execution of your SQL code. I'll talk about that a little bit later. I just want you for now to know that that's possible. We can, we can interpolate our SQL command variables anywhere we want in our script file, and they will be replaced with the variable's value um, in terms of the code that SQL will execute. And this will all get a lot more clearer when we get to the demo. Right now, I just want to give you a high level overview of, um, of what we're talking about so that there's, you have some context before we get into the demonstration. A couple of other um, really important tools in SQL command are the um, input output tools. So we can write out a file using the out keyword. That's the first one on this slide. Um, and we can either send our output out to a file or we can send output to the standard error or standard output um, output streams on your Windows computer. Um, sending the output to standard out is normal execution. That is normal operation. That's what is happening almost all the time in your scripts. So generally speaking, if you want to write a file, you are going to redirect output to that file. And then when you're finished writing that file, you are going to redirect output back to standard output. Um, you can also send errors to a file using the error keyword, uh, sending errors to a file to standard error output, which is where they would normally land, or to standard output. And that can be useful too. If you want to consolidate any error messages with the output of your script, um, then you may want to manipulate the error output. And finally, the R directive, the R keyword, will read in a file name that you specify. So uh, a moment ago, I talked about um, how we can, um, we can uh, make SQL command execute in a way that, is, that recognizes query output. And the way that we do that um, is when we read a file with the R keyword, we are going to execute whatever SQL, whatever SQL script is in closed in that file, OK? So if we write out to a file a list of um, set vars, we can then read those set vars in, uh, if, in, in, in following that in script execution so that we can actually create set vars that are set var values um, that are based on information that we that we get from SQL queries, use print statements to send that to, to our, our file output, and then read that file output back in. We're not going to demonstrate that today. I want you to know about that because it is a major problem solver. Um, it is a technique that will solve a lot of problems for you. Uh, our demo is a little bit more compact than that for today, um, but I, I really wanted to point that out. So today we're only going to look at the R directive. Um, and when you see that um, in the demonstration, you'll, you'll perhaps get a flavor for how that is used. And then um, you can think about how you might apply the, the more advanced technique of um, sending some query output to a file and then reading that file in. OK, um, so those are all the preliminaries. That's the, the, the kind of um, high level 20 minute drinking from the fire hose version of um, SQL command that I wanted to give you so that we could get to this demonstration um, and you'd have a little bit of context for it before I start. So the scenario that we're going to work on today is a scenario that I made up for this demonstration, but it um, has a lot of similarities to some real world stuff that I've seen. And our scenario is that we've got a school district. And this school district has adopted a learning management system 
Um, but unfortunately, there are still some schools that are using the previous learning management system. Uh, this is a scenario that um, you'll see this type of thing happen all the time. We've got a line of business application that some regions or some departments have adopted and other departments are still on um, a legacy or the previous line of business system. Or we've got data from a previous line of business system that we have to extract and consolidate with data from our current line of business system. This is a scenario that comes up all the time. Um, so what we want to do is we want to be able to get um, course, student, and grade information from both of those source systems and consolidate them into one central database so that we can report on all of our students without having to talk to two different systems. That's the scenario that we're going to look at today. And uh, there are four scripts that make up the solution for this scenario. Um, there is a, um, a URL there at the bottom of the slide that points to my GitHub, um, where you can, you can get all the code that you're going to see tonight. You can, um, you can download that code and, and try it out for yourself and, and maybe try to take it in some different directions and experiment with it. Um, and the four scripts that we're going to look at, there is a setup script, um, which is uh, just setting up the environment, creating all of our databases and inserting some sample data for us. Um, and then we have two scripts, uh, SQL command script Northland and Southland, and those are um, our made up line of business systems uh, named after the schools. So we have um, a particular query for getting data from Northland um, learning management system, and we have um, another script that gets data from the Southland learning management system. And then finally, um, the SQL command script.sql file is the control script that executes the entire solution. Okay, so um, without any further ado, I am going to stop sharing for just a moment so that I can switch up my uh, display here and get the, um, my instance of SQL Server Management Studio going. Okay, here we go. Um, so I've got uh, SSMS up here, and what I've done is I've preloaded all four of those scripts that we're talking about, um, as well as uh, I've I've left a um, a query window, a blank query window open, so that we can um, we can maybe write some arbitrary SQL if we need to. So. Um, this script is not particularly interesting. It is just the script that sets up our environment, but I will walk through it just briefly so that we can, um, we can take a look at some of the challenges, the artificial challenges that I've created for this demonstration. Uh, so as I said, we have um, two different learning management systems as our source systems. Um, in this case, I have created um, three school databases so two of them use the Southland system and one of them uses the Northland system. So um, this script would be, or the solution would be valid if we had 10 schools, 20 schools, 30 schools, it wouldn't matter as long as we categorize them uh, into which, uh, which script they need to use to extract data. So you can see the data definition language for the Southland schools. Um, we have a table of students with the student's full name, and, uh, and a our arbitrary ID. We have a classes table that identifies the class name and the class level. Now our school district, our school district doesn't just have a name for classes. It has a code as well. So every class has a code and a name, but because um, the Southland database does not support a separate code and name, we've got them packed into that one column. So uh, the, the class name in the classes table in Southland schools contains the, um, the course code and the course description smushed together into, um, into one column. Uh, and then finally, the grades table in Southland, the grades table contains the midterm exam and the final exam grade uh, so then we've got some code here that um, just 
creates some uh, fake data and inserts it into our um, tables for Southland. Then we create our Westland school um, with the same structure. So remember, this is a Southland style school. So it has the same database structure um, as Southland. Um, insert some more data there. And then we've got our Northland school. And the Northland school uh, database has a few differences. The tables are named differently. Um, and also the data in the tables is stored in slightly different ways. Um, this again is to uh, is just a silly demo that I did, but it is to simulate the kind of um, the kind of variations that we may see in line of business systems where we have to figure out how to take data that is structured slightly differently, even if it represents the same meaning, but it's structured slightly differently, and we have to figure out how to consolidate it. So in this case, um, the students' names are in the kids' table. Um, the students' names are separated. The first name and the last name are stored separately. That means that when we compare data between a Southland-style school and a Northland-style school, um, we have a problem right away because the names are stored in a different way. The problems are compounded because the course code and description in Northland's uh, learning management system are actually stored in separate columns. Um, so we've got, we've got some variations happening already, but also Northland schools do not specify the level of the course. So in, um, in, our, in our fake solution, what, we've, what, what our administrators have done in order to support all of the data points that they need um, even though the learning management system doesn't have the columns they need, they embed the course level into the course code. So this is another difference between our two source databases. In the case of Northland schools, we are, if we are going to make the course code comparable, comparable to um, the Southland schools, we're going to have to get that level information, pull it out of that, um, out of that column and separate it. And finally, the last difference is that the Northland School Learning Management System, for whatever reason, does not record the scoring on individual tests. It just stores the final score, the final course grade. So um, just an aside here, I want to just mention this as we're uh, moving along. This is a, a, a pretty common scenario where you see these kind of differences. Um, between, between systems. And um, I want to point out that in the case of the, um, the course grade system, we have data at two different levels of aggregation. We have data that is um, broken out into individual test performances in the Southland schools. But in the Northland schools, we have the, only the course grade that is, um, that is stored. Um, and what that means is, that we are stuck at that level of aggregation. In our consolidated data store, um, there's only one direction that we can go. We can only go um, to the higher level of aggregation. We can't, um, there's really no way for us to disaggregate um, a final grade into a two exam scores. We just don't have that information. So um, just as an aside, that means that in our design, uh, in the design of our data store um, for the consolidated data, we are, we are pretty much obligated to use that higher level of aggregation. We are obligated to store data at the course grade level because it's, it's the only data that will be consistently available across all source systems. So um, in this demo, I did try to pack in um, even though it's very small, as many of those type of, of um, data extraction challenges as I possibly could. And then we've got some code here that um, inserts some test data into, um, into our Northland Schools line of business system. And then finally, the last bit of this script creates our school district database. Um, and so you can see that we've got the um, information, the same types of information in our central school district database. We've got the school information, which is something that the individual line of business systems don't provide. Um, so here's another challenge that you might face 
in um, in in ETL type work or data extraction work. We've got information. We've got we've got to identify that source system, but the source systems don't identify themselves. There's nothing there's nothing in those databases that identifies um, the the instance because each of those learning management systems is um, is complete in itself, and they're not considering that there might be other systems, other peer systems that contain the same type of data. So we're going to have to synthesize some data to populate that school's table. We've got a student's table. In the case of our, our consolidated um, data, that, um, that student's table contains the full name concatenated. There's no separate first and last name. Our course table, um, so here you can see we've got three different pieces of data and, and our source databases do not have this level of de detail. Um, the source databases are combining uh, two or more of these columns into one in order to present it. So uh, we've got the level of the course, which is the grade, um, the, the, the school grade. Uh, we've got the course code, which is the code uh, that, you know, whatever in our administrative system represents the um, the code and then the course name or the course description, those are all separate fields. So I'll you'll see in the, um, in the specific uh, data extraction queries, how we manage that in a moment. And finally, we've got the course grades table, which um, stores data at the grain of the final course grade. Just like we discussed, there's really nothing that we can do um, to, to disaggregate data that is at a higher level of aggregation. So we're stuck storing the final grade. If we wanted to, um, we might consider uh, how we would store those individual test scores for the source systems that had them. Um, it's, it's a little dangerous to do stuff like that because you would only have partial data in those tables. And um, you've got to be pretty careful when you start to make those kind of choices. So in, in our system, we're taking the safe choice. We are only storing the final grade in our central management system. Okay, so um, that is what this script is doing. I'm just going to execute it. There we go. And now um, all of our databases are created. So just to make sure that's true, um, let's go over to our, okay, so. Okay, there's our data. So we've, um, the script executed successfully. We can see that there is some, some data in our tables. Everything looks copacetic. So let's take a look now at our data extraction scripts. Um, again, just to, just to remind you, we have two different types of system. We have three schools, but between those three schools, there are two different types of database, the Southland type and the Northland type, okay? So first, let's look at the Southland type um, data extraction script. The first thing that I want you to notice here are um, those, those sections of this file that are red. Those are instances where we are, um, well, actually they're, they're uh, quotes, but they're also instances where within those quotes, we are inserting a SQL command variable value. Okay, Th that, that dollar sign and brackets um, around the name of the, um, the variable is the way that you insert the value of that variable into a SQL script. So what you're looking at here um, is, is a SQL script that you can't execute. You can't execute it interactively um, because we're not defining those variables within this script. They're defined elsewhere. So um, as I was talking about earlier, some of the cons of SQL command, we're not actually able to interactively test our scripts quite this easily. Uh, just as you see, the, um, the variables aren't defined, so we're gonna get an error right away and the script will bail out. Um, 
But when we execute this within uh, a script that has populated those variables, um, what we're going to get is those variables will replace the set var names, the variable names, those values will replace the names and um, we'll execute the code with whatever values are there. And what's really cool about this and really valuable is we can put those variable values anywhere we want. So again, here um, we're using it to uh, identify the, um, the actual text that is going to be inserted into, um, into a column. But here we're using a variable to specify the name of the target database. Um, and here we're using it to specify the name of the source database. So this allows us to write a script like this that can be applied to any database that has the same, um, the same structure. And that means that we can use this one code file to import data from our Southland school and from our Westland school, which also uses the Southland style database. That's the power of SQL command. That's what's really valuable. Um, besides that, uh, there's a few things that I wanna kind of show you in this script because they're, they are, um, they, they're the implementation that I came up with to solve those small problems that I created. So the first thing you'll see is the choice that we made here is um, that we are going to use the name of the source database as our school name. In the case of our arbitrary demonstration, this works great because um, those database names are the names of the schools, Northland School, Southland School, Westland School. Um, in a real world scenario, you might not get off so easily. You might have to do some manipulation on those database names or find um, some other way of identifying each of those individual source databases. But in this case, um, we can drop the name of the source database, uh, which is specified by that SQL command variable. We can just drop that in as the school name, solving that problem for us. Um, then in our, um, the next piece of this script is the insert into the um, courses table. Um, this, is the, uh, this is the table that stores information about classes offered at that school. And um, you can see in our insert statement, we are specifying all three of those values, the course's level, the course's code, and the course's name, okay? Um, something important that I, I also wanna call out here is that um, when we are, inserting into a relational database from these source line of business systems, we want to make sure that we don't end up importing the primary keys, the database primary keys from our source system. Um, that may seem like something that would be innocuous, but if you take a look at the data, um, so let's go back to our Go back to our query window and we are going to look at the kids table in Southland and Westland. Oops, where did I get Southland? I may have mixed, mixed up. Um, oh yes, I see. It is, uh, sorry folks, just gotta look at what my, it is, Students, okay. There we go. The name of our table is students. So um, the students table that we're looking now at the students table from two different schools, two different databases, the Westland and the Southland databases. And there are collisions between the primary keys. So um, the, the, the value that is represented by the key one in the Southland school is different from the value represented by the key one in the Westland school. It's really, really important that we, if we are going to use keys in our consolidated data table, and that's not necessarily the case, um, but if we're going to use keys 
in that, in that consolidated database, we have a choice to make. Um, one choice that is very frequently made is to um, use only natural keys. I don't want to get into the details of, um, of uh, natural keys versus other types of keys. That's not what this um, discussion is about. But suffice to say that um, you might want to use something that you know is guaranteed to be unique um, and use that as your key or identifier instead of using kind of the industry standard um, arbitrary meaningless key to represent each individual value. In our case, we have decided to use arbitrary keys in our consolidated system. So what that means is, going back to our Southland script, what that means is that when, whenever we need to identify um, the primary key of a, of a value in a, in a foreign key relationship, when we are referring to that primary key, we're gonna have to get that key information out of the system as we're creating it, um, which is why you'll see some pretty funky queries um, in these files, because in order to do that, um, we have to do some weird SQL tricks. So for, ins for example, um, the first column in the select statement that populates the courses table is the school ID, okay? Well, there is no school ID in any of our source line of business systems. There is only a school ID in our schools table in our target database. So in order to get that information, firstly, we have to make sure we're sequencing our inserts so that we're not referencing any data that we have not already populated into the target system. That's number one. So we're doing that because the first thing we do here is we insert that data into the schools table um, before we do anything else, because we need, that, we need to know which school we're dealing with in um, every other instance of inserting data, because we don't wanna lose track of where our data came from in our target system. So once we've populated that school's information into the school's table, we then in the first column here, we have to get that information out of our target system. See, we're running a query against the target system itself um, because there, that is the only place where keys that have any, um, any referential meaning in this system, that's the only place where they will live. So we have to execute this, um, this little subquery here um, to extract the key information about our school. Uh, you could do this differently. If you wanted to, you could just use the school name as, as a key. Um, that You're running risks when you take, make that kind of choice, but that's an option as well. And then the other thing that we're doing here uh, in this insert into the courses table is if you remember, I indicated that the Southland databases do not have two separate columns for course code and course name. They have smushed all that data together um, into one column and separated it with a dash. So in a Southland system, the school name column has the, the course code dash the course name or course description. Okay, um, and uh, we can take a look at that. Here we go. Let's just take a look at what the classes look like in the Westland School. There we go. We have our world history is H101. Um, and then we're dash separating those values. So we've got values that look like that. And we have to break that up and separate it out into um, two different columns. And that's what you see happening here. Uh, we're using um, a little bit of SQL string manipulation in order to um, basically split that field at that dash and um, populate the, the left half of the value into the course code column and the right half of the value into the course name column. Uh, once we've done that, we populate the students table. This is a, a real easy one in the case of the Southland script because student name is uh, recorded in exactly the same way in um, our target system, in our, our school district database as it is in Southland databases. It's stored, um, it's stored as a full name. So uh, all we have to do is once again, grab that school ID um, using the same type of subquery and then just push that student name right through. And finally, we get into the course grades. 
So um, here, we've already populated our tables, our school table, course table, and students table. So we now can use all of that information to create the um, appropriate references to the, to the relational data in our target system, even though we're querying our source system. And here's how we do that. We join all of these tables together. So you'll see that at the bottom of that query, there is a series of four joins. We're joining data from both the source system and the target system, okay? From the target system based on name and from the source system based on ID because the data from our source system has, that, um, has those IDs that are only meaningful in the source system. So um, we, we use all of those joins so that we can, um, and I'm using T, uh, using uh, table abbreviations beginning with T for target tables. So you can see that just as we did above, we are getting the ID from our target database for a student and from our target database for a course, doing a little math on the um, exam grades in order to come up with a final average grade out of the two. Uh, and populating that into our grades table. So that's what the Southland script looks like. And we won't go as deep into the um, Northland script. I leave that to you to do, look in the GitHub and grab these queries and dig into them yourself. But uh, just suffice to say, we have to make the same kind of choices and do different manipulations on that source data to get it into the format that we need in our target system. So um, now I want you to think about what these queries would look like if we had to do all of this funky stuff to manipulate data and we were trying to build these queries using Dynamic SQL. If we were trying to build these extraction queries using Dynamic SQL um, instead of SQL command, it would be very messy, very messy and very difficult to read. This code, um, I hope it's easy to read because I wrote it, but I think this code is pretty easy to read. This code is pretty easy to understand. Um, as a SQL developer, you can look at it and reason about it without having to um, mentally try to piece together all of the different pieces of code that, that work together to make up your, um, your code output. You don't have to do things like execute your code to a certain point to generate the SQL statement, dump the SQL statement to screen, and then move it into another query window, which is a workflow that I've done way too many times in my career. Uh, this eliminates all of those problems, as well as the security problems of working with dynamic SQL. Of course, the other thing that you could do is um, you could create redundant queries. So we've got two Southland schools and one Northland school. You could simply have code that points directly at those source databases and does the appropriate manipulation and just copy and paste it, make the changes, um, make the changes in, in line that you need to uh, to make those, those two queries distinct. Um, but this is just a toy demo. If you have 20 schools or 50 schools in your school district, um, you can start to see how it would be very cumbersome to maintain that and very error prone to maintain that if you had to have an individual query for every single school that had the same type of database. Very dangerous to do it that way. Um, and anytime that you have to make a change to your code, you're running the risk of introducing errors because you have to make that same change in X number of places. All of those problems go away because we're using SQL command. Finally, um, what we've kind of been leading up to here is this, the script that brings this all together, the script that actually executes the, all of those other queries against the appropriate databases. Okay, so this is the script that populates our target database. Let's walk through it and see what it does. I've got three stanzas here. The first stanza um, sets our variables using set var our target database and our source database. Again, remember, you'll see, you've seen these variable names all throughout these queries, okay? So we specify the target database and the source database, and then we use the 
our keyword to read that SQL script in. And what happens is um, the SQL interpreter will execute whatever is in that file, just like it was part of this query after doing all of the variable substitutions. We repeat that process for Westland School. Um, and then we repeat that process again for Northland School, um, specifying a different script, OK? Specifying a different script. And um, way earlier today, I talked to you about um, being able to use file output to populate a file, OK? If you wanted to do this for a a district that had 30 schools, 50 schools, whatever, uh, you might find it fruitful to actually create a table, either a temporary table or a permanent table in your target database that contains all of the information for these variables and then generate, generate the set bars and the R commands, generate those, write them out to a file and then read them into this script. So you could actually, um, you could control all of these variable values with, um, with, with data that you were able to extract from a SQL table. I'll leave that as an exercise for you if you wanna to try to do it. Um, it's, uh, it's definitely sort of the next level of maintainability, but for the purposes of our demonstration, I just simply um, set those values in line. And uh, the final piece of this query is a, um, a select statement just to show us and make sure that the data all went in okay, um, just, just validating. So let's, let's, before I execute it, let's look at what we expect to see here. Um, we are grabbing consolidated information about schools, students, courses, and grades, okay? From uh, all of the tables in our target database and ordered by school, then course, then student. Okay, so we're getting, um, we're getting that list, but what should we expect? If we look back at our setup script, what we should expect to see is four students in each school participating in four classes, okay? Um, and a total of eight sets of values for grades. So what we should see in our output is 24 rows, eight rows from each school, consolidating all of these values into one database. Let's cross our fingers and see if it works. Okay, and here we go. We've got um, those 24 values, those 24 rows, just what we expected to see, eight student grades, from each source database consolidated into one. So what happened here? We populated those, um, those variables. And then when we read the script from the file, when we read that through um, SQL commands file IO, it took this file, substituted all of the places where there are SQL command variables with the value specified and executed it. So even though there is only one piece, one file that contains the code to extract data from a Southland school and populate the target database, we were able to execute it by um, just providing the, the, a, few, a few variable values um, and we were able to execute it twice uh, and now we don't have to worry about all of the nasty things that would go along with writing the code that would um, would populate these each school individually by hand. Okay, um, and that is the end of my demo. And uh, again, I just want to um, thank everybody for coming.